I want to talk to you tonight about one of my heroes. I can think of four men that I would call heroes. Two of them I have been privileged to know. One is John MacArthur, whom you may have heard of from this pulpit before, who to me is the closest thing in our day to a biblical Daniel. He refused to eat the king's meat. One thing about my heroes is that they were men who would not compromise for anything. The second of my heroes is the late John Gerstner, who was another man who wouldn't compromise God's word for anything or anybody. That's why he was never very popular, because favor with God was more important to him than favor with anybody else. The third of my heroes is a man named Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain. Joshua Chamberlain was a Calvinistic congregational minister from Massachusetts. Excuse me, from the state of Maine, not Massachusetts, the state of Maine. When the Civil War broke out, he tried to enlist, but the faculty would not give him a leave of absence. And so he took a sabbatical. And he went down and he joined the Union Army. You may have never heard of Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain. He's the reason there is still a union today. Because he saved the Northern Army from sure defeat at the Battle of Little Round Top during the Battle of Gettysburg. Ted Turner, I am eternally indebted to him for one thing and one thing only, for making a movie called Gettysburg. And if you get the chance to watch it, please do. And take special, it's four hours long, so give yourself a day. It's worth every moment that you spend on it. Chamberlain is the hero, one of many heroes on both sides. At the Battle of Little Round Top, on the second day of the battle, Chamberlain and his men from Maine, the 20th Maine, were taken up to Little Round Top and he was given these instructions. You are the end of the line. You cannot surrender. You cannot give up the field. The Confederate Army had a letter of surrender already printed out, ready to put on Abraham Lincoln's desk as soon as they broke through the Union lines at Gettysburg. There was nothing between them and Washington, D.C. Now, Chamberlain didn't know that. He just knew that he had been given these instructions. You cannot fail. Whatever the cost, you must hold this position. I've stood on that spot, and it brings tears to my eyes because of what this man stood. He was a man who would not compromise. The Confederates were coming up the hill. His men held them off. They kept coming. His men held them off. They started to run out of ammunition. The men, Confederates kept coming. It was a bloodbath. Finally, his men are out of ammunition. And his underlings say to him, we've got to retreat. He says, we can't retreat. Our orders were to hold the ground, no matter what the cost. They said, but we don't have any bullets. What are we going to do? He said, fix bayonets. We're going to charge. What? Excuse me? <laughs> Those men have guns, and they're firing. He says, we can't give up the ground. I my orders were to hold this ground. So fix bayonets, we're going to charge. We're going to surprise them. Of course, now in the movie, there's magnificent music. Life would be so much easier if there was music <laughs> attached to it. I mean, if every time you get in a fight with your wife or your husband, and you are tempted to say something mean and nasty to shut them up, and then you hear God's voice saying, don't do that. Keep your mouth shut. And you say, okay, Lord, I'll obey. You don't hear anything singing the hallelujah chorus. <laughs> or, for he's a jolly good fellow, or anything like that. And so Chamberlain and his men charged down the hill, and they so surprised the Confederates that they all surrendered. And he saved the Union Army at the Battle of Gettysburg. Because he said there'll be no compromise, there'll be no surrender, and there'll be no retreat. 
That's what every one of you Christian soldiers should have as your motto. I want to introduce you to my other hero, Jonathan Edwards. Two of these men I've been privileged to know. One of these men I've been privileged to read about. This man I'm privileged to be related to. I am descended from Jonathan Edwards through my grandmother on my dad's side. That's a great thing for me. I'm sure it embarrasses him to no end, but to me it's a very great thing. <clears throat> there was a man named Perry Miller in the last century who probably did more to introduce the academic world to Jonathan Edwards than anyone in the last century. Perry Miller was a card-carrying atheist, a hard-living, hard-drinking, scholarly man who thought Edwards was absolutely out of his mind theologically, but he said he was, quote, the greatest philosopher theologian ever to grace the American scene. And yet this giant of an intellect has been vilified and castigated almost since the moment he set foot on that scene. It is my desire in this series of lectures, and these really won't be sermons, they will be, tonight is more historical context, and then five attempts to clarify for you Edward's theology on some things that may be difficult to understand. But I want to vindicate this great preacher and to focus on his theology, which came rationally as well as biblically from how he saw God. Tonight, I'm just going to tell you about his life and ministry. Kind of whet your appetite, film at 11 type of a thing. Jonathan Edwards was born in East Windsor, Connecticut on October 5th, 1703, the only son of a congregational minister, Timothy Edwards, and Esther Stoddard, the daughter of the great Solomon Stoddard. They had 10 daughters, but only one son. The Edwards family was rather tall. Each of the daughters, each of his sisters, was six feet tall. And Edwards would often refer to his 60 feet of sisters. <laughs> the Indians had named the area that we call East Windsor Podunk. Now, to the Indians, that meant cornfield. It means something much different to us. I've been there, and on, there's a uh, historical marker. On this site, Jonathan Edwards was born. Timothy Edwards, his father, was the eldest son of a prosperous Hartford, Connecticut merchant and lawyer named Richard Edwards, who married wealthy Elizabeth Tuttle of New Haven, Connecticut. Timothy graduated from Harvard in 1691 and was ordained minister of the church in East Windsor in 1694, a pastorate he held for 62 years. These men were faithful men. They didn't see this church as a stepping stone to the next church so they could get a bigger church and a bigger church, etc., etc. These men saw themselves as being married to their congregation, and you didn't put asunder what God had put together. Esther Stoddard was the daughter of Solomon Stoddard. He was the second minister of the church at Northampton. Eliezer Mather, you've heard the name Mather before, Cotton Mather, Richard Mather, Samuel Mather. Eliezer Mather was the older brother of Increase Mather, who was pretty much the patriarch of the whole family. And he had been the uncle to Cotton Mather. He was the first minister. When he died, the town called 27-year-old Harvard graduate Solomon Stoddard, who had been that college's first librarian. The year was 1669. Stoddard really had no thoughts about going into the ministry. In fact, he had boarded all of his stuff on a ship going down to the Bahamas and Jamaica and that area. When the call came, that he should go out to Northampton and be the pastor of that church. It wasn't really what he had planned to do with his life. But he did accept the call. Now again, Eliezer Mather's widow, Esther, was now a widow. Her husband had died. 
In 1670, Stoddard married Esther Mather, Eliezer's widow, who already had three children by her first husband. She and Solomon had 12 of their own. What do you do on a cold winter's night in western Massachusetts? You be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth single-handedly, evidently. <clears throat> it was their daughter Esther who married Timothy Edwards and who bore him a son named Jonathan. As the only son of a minister, John, young Jonathan was greatly impacted by his father's preaching and ministry. Listen to what he wrote at the age of eight. I had a variety of, he could write at eight. I had a variety of concerns about my soul from childhood, but had two remarkable seasons of awakening before I met with the change by which I was wrought to those new dispositions and that new sense of things that I since have had. Sounds like a typical eight-year-old to me. <laughs> there was no Barney to sing along with in those days, you know. The first time was when I was a boy, some years before I went to college, at a time of remarkable awakening in my father's congregation. Let me just make a point here. When we talk about great awakenings, an awakening is not a revival. An awakening is when a sinner becomes aware that he is a sinner. He is awakened to his sinful condition. So when the great awakening took place, that means there was a great number of people who had the cobwebs shook out of their heads and said, I'm not saved. The revival is when Christian people start acting like Christian people. I continue, Edward said, I was very much affected for many months and concerned about the things of religion and my soul's salvation and was abundant in duties. I used to pray in secret five times a day and to spend much time in religious talk with other boys, meeting with them in secret to pray together. I experienced I know not what kind of delight in religion. Now for him, religion is synonymous with Christianity. Okay. My mind was much engaged in it, and it was my delight to abound in religious duties. I, with some of my schoolmates, built a booth for a place of prayer. Besides that, I had a secret place of my own in the woods where I used to retire by myself and was from time to time much affected. Already a prodigy, wouldn't you say? He studied at a school run by his father. It was very normal in that time because ministers didn't make much. I mean, they don't make much now, but they made even less then. They might have gotten a very rich minister would have gotten 100 British pounds a year, or about eight pounds a month. And he would have been paid extra, where Farmer Brown would have given him two gallons of milk a week, and Farmer Smith over here would bring him two dozen eggs a week, and so-and-so would donate two bales of hay for his cattle and his horses a week, I mean a month, and such things as that. And that's how they made it through the time and the church would give them a manse for them to live in. So Jonathan began his studies in Latin at the age of six under his father's tutelage. At the age of 13, he entered the Collegiate School of Connecticut at New Haven, later to become Yale College. Now a college at that time was what a high school is for us. So when he says, I went to college at the age of 13, it's not because he was brilliant, they didn't have a high school. So each minister in the local town would have a school that would meet in the church building and the young people would come and the parents would pay a quarter a month or something like that for their children to be educated by the minister. Because of controversies and splits though, Jonathan spent half his time at an extension at Wethersfield, Connecticut, closer to Harvard than to New Haven. The main controversy at the time was over a man named Samuel Johnson, who was the main tutor. His public declaration that they were leaving the Congregational Church and going to the Church of England. In 1754, Johnson founded the King's College in New York, which was later to become, anybody? Columbia. Columbia University. Jonathan was one of ten freshmen at the school. 
He spent six years studying. The last two were graduate school years. He chose Weatherfield because Elisha Williams, the tutor there, was a very orthodox man, and he was also a relative of Edwards through his mother. His first year, he studied arithmetic, algebra, Latin, Greek, and Hebrew. How's that for a 13-year-old curriculum? The second year was geometry, rhetoric, and logic. The third year was physics and natural philosophy, and it was here that he began reading the writings of a man named John Locke from England. Edwards was very impressed with Locke's book, The Reasonableness of Christianity. His two postgraduate years was uniquely in theology. And in 1720, Edwards was chosen to give the commencement oration as the highest ranking student among the undergraduate. Typical school day was to rise at daybreak for prayers, then to study till noon, then to attend classes and to study till evening prayers and supper. Students were to be in bed by, in their room by nine and in bed by 11. When was a football game? None of that. They were to go to school to go to school. What a novel concept. <laughs> Towards the end of his undergraduate years at Yale, Edwards fell ill due to pleurisy. He wrote of his illness, quote, God brought me nigh to the grave and shook me over the pit of hell. But he recovered and returned what he called to his former ways of sin. We've got time to sin with a schedule like that. But somewhere around the age of 18 to 20, God was pleased to impart what Edwards called a divine and supernatural light into his soul and to convert him. Let me read you three or four paragraphs from Edwards' personal narrative. The first instance that I remember of that sort of inward sweet delight in God and divine things that I have lived much in since was in reading those words from 1 Timothy 1.17. Now unto the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. As I read these words, there came into my soul and was, as it were, quite diffused through it, a sense of the glory of the divine being, a new sense, quite different from anything I ever experienced before. Never any words of Scripture seemed to me as, this, as these words did. I thought with myself how excellent a being that was and how happy I would be if I might enjoy that God and be wrapped up in Him in heaven and be, as it were, swallowed up in Him forever. I kept saying, and as it were, singing over these words of Scripture to myself. And I went to pray to God that I might enjoy Him and prayed in a manner quite different from what I used to do with a new sort of affection. But it never came into my thoughts that there was anything spiritual or of a saving nature in this. From about that time, I began to have a new kind of apprehensions and ideas about Christ and the work of redemption and the glorious way of salvation by Him. My mind was greatly engaged to spend my time in reading and meditating on Christ, on the beauty and excellency of His person and the lovely way of salvation by free grace in Him. Now, speaking of hell, it's starting to feel like that up here. The appearance of everything was altered. There seemed to be a calm, sweet cast or appearance of divine glory in almost everything. God's excellence, His wisdom, His pur purity and love seemed to appear in everything. I had vehement longings of soul after God and Christ and more holiness, wherewith my heart seemed to be full and ready to break. I was almost constant in prayer wherever I was, Prayer seemed to be as natural to me as the breath that I breathe. These former delights never reached the heart and did not arise from any sight of the divine excellence of the things of God. That's an 18-year-old. But you see, as we say so often, garbage in, garbage out. Bible in, Bible out. When he was about 20, Edwards met a girl named Sarah Pierpont. 
who at that time was only 13 years old. But it was not uncommon for 13-year-olds to get married. And yet she displayed such uncommon character that Edwards waxed eloquent of her when he wrote his famous description of his wife-to-be some four years later. Sarah Pierpont was the great-great-granddaughter of a man named Thomas Hooker, another great English and then American Puritan. Her father, James Pierpont, was a minister of the church at New Haven for 30 years. He was a Harvard graduate who had married the granddaughter of John Davenport, New Haven's first minister. Both his first two wives died early in life. It was his idea to start a college at New Haven, which was to become Yale University. His third marriage was to Mary Hooker, who was to become Sarah Pierpont's mother. In the front page of a Greek grammar book, Edwards wrote this of Sarah. And remember, she's somewhere between 13 and 17 years old at this time. They say there is a young lady in New Haven who is beloved of that great being who made and rules the world. And there are certain seasons in which this great being, in some way or another invisible to me, comes to her and fills her mind with exceeding sweet delight, and she hardly cares for anything except to meditate on him. She has a strange sweetness in her mind and a singular purity in her affections. She is most just and conscientious in all her conduct. And you could not persuade her to do anything wrong or sinful if you would give her all the world. She is of a wonderful sweetness, calmness, and universal benevolence of mind. She will sometimes go about from place to place singing sweetly and seems to be always full of joy and pleasure and no one knows for what. She loves to be alone walking in the fields and groves and seems to have someone invisible always conversing with her. Now, even allowing for romantic fantasy as to how great a person is or isn't, did you notice the conspicuous absence of any reference to how hot she was or wasn't? It was all spiritual. After graduating from Yale, Edward spent six to nine months filling the pulpit for a small Presbyterian church in New York City at the corner of Broadway and Wall Street. After that, he was offered a position in Bolton, Connecticut, but he had the option of returning to Yale for a graduate degree, and he chose that. He received his master's degree in 1723, and in 1724 became the main tutor at Yale. For all practical purposes, he was put in charge of the college at the age of 21. He noted that he didn't care for the administrative duties that came with the position, however. He pursued Sarah Pierpont. He wrote to her regarding not delaying marriage. He said, quote, patience is commonly esteemed a virtue, but in this case, I think it's a vice. <laughs> Finally, he sounds like a typical man. They married when Edwards was 24 and Sarah was 17. It was customary at that time for a girl to marry before she was 16 which was realistic because the life expectancy at that time was 33. In 1726, Edwards was appointed pastor to the church where his grandfather, Solomon Stoddard, who was now nearly 85, was still preaching every Sunday. It was part of Edwards' duties to preach every other Sunday to relieve his grandfather. Edwards and Sarah were married in 1727. They came to Northampton and stayed with Stoddard until they could find a suitable dwelling place. Every town in New England at that time had to show that they had an able Orthodox minister and enough land for two ministers to live on, as well as a school. So the newlywed couple built a simple house on a plot of land where a house had stood that was burned down by an Indian attack. That house is no longer there. It was torn down in the early 1900s, and now a Polish Catholic church sits on that site. You wouldn't know that Edwards had ever lived there if the name of the street around it was not called Edwards Square. 
There were two very large elm trees in the front yard of that home, and they were known as the Edwards Elms. And in the early 1900s, a man bought the property for no other reason than to cut down the elm trees. His statement was, I do not want anything left of that horrible man's memory in this town. If you went to Northampton now, if you didn't know where to go, you wouldn't find anything. The site on which his church stood, there's still a church. Uh, his church burned down, and uh, now there's a large brick congregational church over 100 years old on it. The last time I was there, it was a uh, joint service meeting of the United Congregational Church and the American Baptist Association, and there was a lesbian woman who was the pastor. Now, if she's still there or not, I have no idea, but she was then. Um, there is a stone in front of the steps leading into the church that was the same stone that was there at Edwards Church. Uh, Northampton, Massachusetts is now known as the lesbian capital of the Northeast, largely due to the all-girl school Smith College there. They do not want to be known as the town of Jonathan Edwards. They want to be known as the hometown of Herbert Hoover. They want nothing to do with Edwards. Edwards started his work alongside his grandfather at the same salary, 100 pounds a year. Right now, that would, it's an exchange rate, that would be $200 a year. The congregation must have seen something in him and that they didn't want to let him get away and then they added 300 pounds to purchase a lot and build a house. And that is at the corner of King Street and Edwards Square. I'll talk to you for a minute about Solomon Stoddard. Solomon Stoddard is one of the most fascinating figures in American church history. He had been the pastor at the Northampton Church for two years before he officially accepted their call to the pastorate. He had been a minister there for six years before he believed he was converted. He thought he was. His wife seemed to be the one who noticed the problem. Isn't that always the case? Stoddard related the story that one day he was studying and he saw his wife uh, primping and preparing to get dressed to leave the manse. He asked her where you're going and she said that she and some of the ladies in the congregation were meeting to pray. And he said, I think that's wonderful. What are you praying about? She says, well, quite frankly, dear, we're praying for your conversion. None of us think you're a Christian. That struck him. And it was some months later, while he was administering the Lord's Supper, that Stoddard felt God changed his heart. And this led in part to his belief that other persons who were church members and un were unsure of their salvation, might be converted in the same act of receiving the Lord's Supper. All of this was a logical continuation of what is called the halfway covenant, which allowed persons to join the church who could affirm the doctrines of historic Christianity and did not openly live scandalous lives. They believed themselves to be saved but they couldn't give the kind of visible evidence that the churches of New England wanted so as to call them visible saints. So they could be church members but not communing church members. Now what was going on in New England at the time was there was a real separatist movement and so often things in church history are an overreaction to a previous abuse of something. So if the pendulum had been all the way over here, it goes all the way over here instead of right here. Well, some of the churches in New England, particularly uh, pastored by the Mather family and some others, were so upset with the Church of England, and they called it an apostate church, that in order to have membership in one of their churches, you had to have renounced the Church of England as an apostate church. They wanted visible, demonstrative evidence of your so-called conversion. And they were asking you to bring witnesses who could attest to your changed life. 
you had to be able I'm giving you ideas, I can see that. <laughs> they wanted you to be able to tell the date and time that you were converted, how you knew that you were converted, and now we'll see your witnesses come in and say, this is different about. It. Well, Solomon Stoddard said, I don't know the day and time I was converted. I believe I was, but I couldn't give you the date and evidence. And he says, I don't think you can ask for anything more than a credible profession of faith. He says, if we had to give that kind of evidence, who of us could ever be a church member? So his position was this, if you believe you're a Christian, you can give um, a credible profession of your faith and what that means, satisfying the elders of the church, you can become a member as long as you do not live a scandalous life. If you do live a scandalous life after this, you come under discipline. That's pretty much the way it is in most churches today. They ask for a credible profession of faith, and they discipline you if you betray that profession at a later time. Stoddard's thinking was that if they were church members, they were entitled to the Lord's Supper. I mean, think of it. How do you say to somebody, well, he's a member of the church, but we don't let him have the Lord's Supper? Was he under discipline? No. Well, then how can you hold the Lord's Supper from a church member? This is what Stoddard is thinking. If the church had reservations about their conversion, they shouldn't be allowed to be church members, but if they're church members, they have a right to the ordinances of the church. In Stoddard's thinking, even if it was the case that these folks were not really saved, they might get saved while taking the Lord's Supper, not from taking the Lord's Supper. That's been the charge that people have leveled against him, which is a caricature in fact, the Mathers wrote, and I've read the correspondence between the Mathers and Stoddard, they said, well, why don't we get all the harlots and bring them in and pour wine down their throats? You'll get them all saved. He says, I'm not talking about the people outside the church. I'm talking about the people inside the church. He died in 1728, and Edwards was appointed as his successor. It is noteworthy that when Solomon Stoddard died, the report of his life and death took up the entire front page of the Boston newspaper. Boston is about a two-hour drive by car from Northampton in western Massachusetts. When Jonathan Edwards died, the account of his life and death took up two lines on the back page. Now that should just give you an idea of how significant a figure Solomon Stoddard was. In 1731, Edwards first published sermon appeared. The occasion was he was asked to preach in Boston to the ministers, and he was the first non-Harvard graduate to be asked to do this. In 1734, his sermon, A Divine and Supernatural Light, was published. The years 1734 to 35 saw the first Great Awakening. Another one took place in 1740, and in 1746, his classic work, The Religious Affections, was published. That book is a study of true and false Christianity. He continued as pastor at Northampton until 1750 when he was shamefully dismissed. The real reason was over Edward's disagreement with his grandfather over church membership and admission to the Lord's Supper, which bothered many of his parishioners. But the uprising had begun six years earlier when Pastor Edwards became aware that some teenage boys in his congregation were reading a midwife's manual, which at that time was considered to be salacious material. Now, you have to understand that in those days, it was the law. Everybody had to go to church on the Lord's Day. They still thought of it as the Sabbath. And it was the law of the land that you were in church, whether you were a believer or not, whether you understood or not, whether you agreed or not. You, by law, were in church, and if you weren't in church, you were in the stocks. In fact, you may not know this, but the reason that the midweek prayer meeting was started was because of this. When people didn't show up for church on Sunday, they had to show up on Wednesday night to appear before the elders and the civil magistrate to give a good reason why they weren't in church on Wednesday night. And then the people would pray for them and their souls. 
Well, as society grew more and more liberal and less and less spiritual, people started saying, I don't have to tell anybody why I wasn't in church on Wednesday night. I'll spend an hour in the stocks if that's all it is. Nuts to these people. And so then people wouldn't show up at all on Wednesday night. The people just prayed for them. And that's how the Wednesday night prayer meeting got started, was praying for people who weren't in church on Sunday morning. Anyway, uh, somebody came and told Edwards about these teenage boys. I have a copy of this book at home, and it has illustrations of the female reproductive system, which was quite a thing for back then. <clears throat> now we don't even bat an eye at stuff like that. Well, evidently what was happening was the boys were taking the book, hiding it under their coats, sneaking up on some unsuspecting woman, opening the pages to where the pictures were, so he said, is that what it looks like in there, lady? And she'd scream and they'd run away laughing. And we think today, well, what's so big about that? That's just mischievous. It was scandalous. Edwards got the names of the boys and the next Sunday in church, he announced the names of the boys from the pulpit. Now you can imagine how that went over, particularly since one of the boys was the son of one of his elders. And, the other one, and another one was one of the mayor's sons. He was on borrowed time from that time on. By trying to rescind Stoddard's views, he became assailed not only by his congregation, but by other local ministers, nearly all of them relatives. Part of one man's animosity was such because his son had committed suicide after hearing Edwards preach on hell and the damnation awaiting sinners. It's his fault. My boy's dead because of that man. And so the uprising began. So by a vote of 230 to 23, or 10 to 1, and that was just the men, the women couldn't vote then. Edwards was voted out as pastor. Now here's the heart of this gracious man. He went to these people and said, if you cannot find pulpit supply to come in and preach to the church, I will do it for free. I don't know, if a church fired me, I don't know if I just, Okay, if you can't find anybody, I'll come in and preach to all these people who hate me. So they fired him as their minister, and then they hired him to preach. But after six months, even that stopped. And it was so bad that if they couldn't find anybody to preach, they just didn't hold services at all. Now think of this. Okay, we couldn't find anybody to preach. We could get Jonathan Edwards for free. Nah, we just won't hold church this week. In fact, Northampton couldn't find another minister for several years. One visitor to the pulpit was so bad that he was expelled from the pulpit in the middle of his sermon. <laughs> After his dismissal, Edwards was refused the privilege of using ministry land. They threw him out of the house. Three of his daughters were about to be married. In 1752, he was 2,000 pounds in debt. Things were so bad financially that his daughters were taking in sewing and making fans to be sold in Boston to help the family make ends meet. Edwards never once defended himself. He never railed against his accusers, the main one of which was a relative. And years later, after Edwards had died, that relative took out a full-page ad in the Boston newspaper repenting of what he'd done. A little late, Edwards was invited by his friends in Scotland to move over there and to become the pastor of a Presbyterian church in Scotland where he had many friends and admirers. In fact, they sent him money to help him get through to the difficult times. But he was unwilling to move that far. But it wasn't really the distance. He told his wife, that's too far to go to get fired again. I couldn't take it. <clears throat> In the summer of 1751, he agreed to go to Stockbridge, which is about 40 miles west of Northampton, as a minister to a few English families and a missionary to the Indians. In the Stockbridge Historical Society, 
they have some of the furniture Edwards built for himself. One of them was an octagon desk, <coughs> eight-sided, angled, where he would sit and he could spin it. So here was his writing paper, but he wanted to get his Greek New Testament. He'd just spin it, stop it there. <laughs> and then if he had uh, a Latin translation of Calvin's Institute, he'd spin it to that and read it to, spin it back to his paper. It's a brilliant thing. <coughs> That'll be part of the tour I take these folks on. He preached to the Indians through an interpreter, and it was while at Stockbridge he wrote his most famous work, The Freedom of the Will, which we will discuss in a few weeks. He also wrote The Nature of True Virtue, the end for which God created the world, and his treatise on original sin. In 1757, the president of the College of New Jersey, now called Princeton, died of a fever. His name was Aaron Burr. It was his son who was the uh, criminal. He was the husband of Esther Edwards, the daughter of Jonathan and Sarah. Aaron Burr married Esther Edwards. They had a son named Aaron Burr Jr. who killed James Hamilton or Alexander Hamilton in a duel. So the, within two days, the trustees had elected Jonathan Edwards to succeed him. Edwards was enjoying his life at Stockbridge. The Indians were docile parishioners. He was writing and wanted to finish a book called A History of the Work of Redemption. He felt completely unsuited to govern a college. And remember that while he was at Yale, he found very distasteful the duties of being an administrator. He wrote in a letter to the governors of the college, I think I can write better than I speak. One other reason for his dismissal at Northampton was Edwards did not see his job as going around and visiting people and sipping tea and just having lighthearted discussions. He told them, if you need me, you know where my house is, my door is always open and I will drop everything and meet with you on a moment's notice. But I think I'm much better off for you writing sermons and expositing God's word than I am sipping tea with you. And that didn't sit very well. So strikes one, two, and three. <clears throat> Edwards had friends named Joseph Bellamy and Samuel Hopkins. They urged him to accept the presidency of the College of New Jersey in Princeton. A council of ministers met at Stockbridge and informed him it was his duty to go. Now Edwards had said to Bellamy and Hopkins, I do not want to go, but I will do this. You put together a group of ministers, and if they are all unanimous, then I will go. And the ministers met, and they were all unanimous. And Edwards broke down and burst into tears in the presence of these men and his parishioners. He said afterwards, I couldn't understand how they had so easily surmounted his arguments except against accepting this position. I've been in prayer in tears ever since myself. But he felt he had to honor his word and obey the council. So in January 1758, he moved to Princeton. He left his family behind and said, you can join me shortly. He began to preach every Sunday in the college hall. He gave out questions in theology to the seniors to be answered at their leisure. That was his only duties. At that time in Princeton, smallpox was raging. And a new inoculation was being touted. Edwards was quite a progressive thinker, so he allowed himself to be inoculated on February 23rd, and he caught smallpox from the inoculation. His throat swelled up so much that he couldn't swallow. He developed a sec secondary fever, and on March 22nd, he died in his bed at the president's house at Princeton. He is buried in the president's cemetery on Witherspoon Street. I have been there several times. Whenever I'm anywhere near the area, I go there to visit the gravesite. There's a very interesting story that when Edwards died, his grandson, Aaron Burr Jr., who is alleged to have been converted late in life, asked to be buried at the foot of his grandfather's grave. But he insisted <clears throat> 
that a hedge be planted between the two graves and built up. He says, I do not want to embarrass my grandfather in death like I've already embarrassed him in life. And so he asked that that hedge be put between their two graves. The first time I was there, there was the hedge. The second time I was there, the hedge had been taken down because the groundskeepers knew nothing about that story. And I went to find the groundskeeper. What happened to the hedge? Uh, it was old. Nobody felt like taking care of it, so we just cut it up. Do you know why it was there? Uh, no. And I told him the story. He was very embarrassed. Evidently, my job is to go around correcting the entire world's theology <laughs> and to inform them about the subtleties of church history. That's a very poignant story. Dr. William Shippen administered the smallpox inoculation to Edwards and was his physician throughout his fatal illness. I'd like to be the guy who would spend the rest of his life blaming himself for causing the death of Jonathan Edwards. After Edwards died, Dr. Shipping wrote to Sarah. Remember, his wife was not there. He died alone. Never did any mortal man more fully and clearly evidence the sincerity of all his professions by one continued, universal, calm, cheerful resignation and patient submission to the divine will through every stage of his disease than he did. Not so much as one discontented expression, nor the least appearance of murmuring through the whole thing. And never did any person expire with more freedom from pain, not so much as one distorted hair, but in the most proper sense of the words, he simply fell asleep. Sounds like Stephen in Acts, doesn't it? When he was being stoned. His final words were spoken to his daughter, Trust in God, and ye need not fear. Two weeks later, his daughter died of smallpox. Six months later, his beloved wife, Sarah, died. His daughter left behind an infant son, two years old. His name was Aaron Burr, Jr. In 1900, someone went through the descendants of Jonathan Edwards. Now, this is 110 years ago. Here is what he found. Thirteen college presidents... 65 professors at academic institutions, three U.S. senators, 100 lawyers, three governors, one dean of a law school, 30 judges, 56 doctors, 80 holders of public office, one dean of a medical school, three mayors of large U.S. cities, one vice president of the United States, 100 overseas missionaries, and one comptroller of the U.S. Treasury and one fat, ugly old book publisher. <laughs> Members of his line had written by that time 135 books, and all of that was over 100 years ago. The legacy is surely much enlarged by now. Because I am a descendant of Jonathan Edwards on my father's side and Oliver Cromwell on my mother's side, I stand in the line of Eliezer Mather, Solomon Stoddard, Thomas Hooker, Jonathan Edwards, John Davenport, James Pierpont, and many other great men. When Jonathan Edwards died, his estate was settled about a year after his death. He left behind all of his manuscripts, consisting of 15 folio volumes, 15 quarto volumes, that size, although thicker, 1,000 sermon manuscripts to his life, to his wife, excuse me. All of that it was appraised at the value of six pounds, 12 bucks. I'd have given him 20 for it and not even thought twice about it. <laughs> at his memorial service, these sermon manuscripts were handed out to relatives as souvenirs. So they went all over New England. In 1905, the Edwards family had a reunion, and they decided to bring all those things back and put them in one central location so that the whole world could have access to them. Now, how many were lost 
in that 150 years, I have no idea. But all, the, all but a few of the Edwards manuscripts are at Yale University. The two men in charge of the Jonathan Edwards project are both evangelical and devout Calvinists. Harry Stout, a PCA minister, and Ken Minkema, very, very devout. Where the first man thought that Edwards was crazy, these two men think he's right. I remember a few years ago going to the Beinecke Rare Book Room, <clears throat> and you have to show yourself to have some legitimate reason to want to see these manuscripts. They're kept floors below the ceiling, I mean below the floor, way down in the ground in air-conditioned, climate-controlled places. Before the, They have to bring you up one and let you look at it. So of course I wanted to see Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. So they brought it to me. And it's about the size of post-it notes. Edwards would handwrite his sermons out on both sides, and then he'd take a needle and thread and sew all the little pieces together. He'd hold it in the palm of his hand. I can't tell you how my hand was shaking. I held the, the manuscript from which Edwards read his sermon myself in a shaking hand. Very interesting to me that the date on that sermon was June 1741. Any of you historians know the date that that was preached in Enfield, Connecticut? July 8, 1741. So I asked my friend Ken Minkema, why is the date Jul June 1741 instead of July 1741? He says, well, June 1741 is the day he preached that sermon at his own church. He says, really? How'd it go over? He says, absolutely bombed. There was no reaction to it whatsoever. Just one more sermon by Edwards on hell, ho-hum. Except that night there was a minister in the church from Enfield, Connecticut, about 35 miles away. And he came up to Edwards and he said, my people are sottish, which is an old Puritan word for dull, senseless, emotionally dead, spiritually dead, sottish. Would you please come to my church and preach that same sermon? He says, you mean the one that just bombed? That one. He says, well, I'm a little busy on Sundays. And the minister said, pick a day. We'll hold a service. So they picked it. It was a Wednesday night. And Edwards went to Enfield, Connecticut. The church was packed. That church no longer exists. But in the town graveyard at Enfield, Connecticut, there's a little placard about the size of this binder. It says, near this site stood the church where Jonathan Edwards preached his famous sermon and started the Great Awake. That's all there is. But that night, the Spirit of God moved in that church. Edwards, because the people were stomping up and down in the balcony, he was afraid the balcony was going to collapse and kill everybody down below. And he threatened him, if you don't stop that, I'm going to stop preaching. And you know, Edwards didn't raise his voice and lower it like I do. He simply read from his manuscript because he didn't want to be accused of manipulating the congregation. He just read his sermon. Now, it wasn't like one of those uh, teleprompter things that you get on the telephone. Please enter the number one. It wasn't like that. He just read it. But the Holy Spirit takes our inadequacies when when and if he wants to move and starts awakenings. And as your pastor knows, it's our job to preach. What God does with it is up to him. Well, I wanted to introduce you to my hero tonight. As I said, all of those manuscripts were appraised at six pounds. But what Edwards left the church as a model, as a minister, and as a faithful expositor is absolutely priceless. <laughs>